I want to sort of briefly look at some architecture examples as well to give an idea of what kind of architectures we might look at when we are trying to solve various problems. Right? The main sort of hardware units that we are looking at inside any given computation are broadly, you know, you can think of them as every uh, kind of hardware that we are interested in, at least from the context of this course, we will need to have an ALU, arithmetic and logic unit, and it will definitely need to have integer operations because those are the most fundamental. Very often such systems computational units will also need floating point either as coprocessors or as part of the main system itself. Right? Very and, and often what you'll find is that microcontrollers and low power devices will not have floating point support simply because it's too expensive. Right? There is too much silicon is needed on those things and it's not worthwhile to do that. The recommendation is as far as possible don't use floating point on a microcontroller. Okay. On the other hand you might have things like DSPs, signal processors which have specialized multiply accumulate units or FPGAs that have hardware DSP slices that are customizable multiply accumulate units. Right? Those are the different kinds of hardware units that are typically used to build up an architecture. Now uh, having all the units is good. But what we would really also like to do is see how fast the system can run. And the raw clock speed is usually determined by the complexity of the hardware itself. Right? Which is ultimately determined by something called the critical path, which is uh, the sum of delays through a certain path in a circuit. Now, running at higher speed unfortunately also means there is typically more sort of switching activity per second, which means more power is being consumed. Okay. Another way by which I can run systems faster is to, by using something called overclocking. Running things at a higher voltage and then because they are running at a higher voltage, I'll be able to, the propagation delays decrease and I'll be able to run it at a higher frequency. Unfortunately, this has a double effect on power consumption. You are running at a higher voltage and at a higher frequency. The impact on power is usually quadratic or even worse than that. So, you can do this if all that you are interested in is getting things to run really fast, but power consumption becomes a major issue in such a scenario. The other thing that you need to be concerned about when you are looking at architectures is how efficiently can they transfer data. So, there are multiple ways of doing this. There are parallel buses, there are serial buses, especially off-chip communication when you need to go from one mode to another. We very often prefer serial communications. An example is of course USB, right? The universal serial bus. But even something like Ethernet, in some sense, is serial. It's a slightly parallel bus in the sense that you know typically they use like four wires or something like that. But among those four wires, essentially the speed is obtained by essentially serializing as much data as possible. So in other words, you definitely do not have a 32-bit parallel bus. Another thing to keep in mind is anytime you need to go off chip, that is to say communicate between two chips, the capacitances are much larger than if you are just communicating on chip, which means that the delays involved as well as the power consumption are both going to increase. Right? And one last consideration in terms of how much data can be transferred by a given architecture is the fact that with wide buses, I can typically transfer more bits per second. By a wide bus, I mean 64 bits instead of 32 bits or, you know, if possible, 128 to 256 bit buses, right? Having said that, when I have like 256 bits or even 1024 bits, right, going up to those levels, synchronizing all of them and making sure that the data is actually being transferred in sync from one chip to another is very hard to do, okay? So, uh, these are done when you need that kind of bandwidth, but in general, otherwise you prefer to use fewer wires. So with all of that in mind, let's look at a few examples of architectures. One of them is the, you know, the low end, so to say, the Arduino. Right? Uh, this is a, basically, many of you are probably familiar with it as a sort of hobby board. Right? You can use it for as a microcontroller just to sort of play around with has a 16 megahertz clock, 2 kilobytes of SRAM, no floating point, right? Can do 
very little computation and very little memory transfer as well. 32 megabytes per second, which sounds like it is a lot, but as we'll see later, is actually extremely less. And the number of instructions per second that it can do is basically determined by its clock, right? 16 megahertz, 16 million instructions per second. And if at all you want to do floating point computations on this, it's a really bad idea because it doesn't have a floating point unit. Every floating point instruction has to be emulated in software. So your result is going to be far fewer than 16 megaflops, that is floating point operations per second. Now, if I wanted to do something like AlexNet on this, and let's say I achieve 10 megaflops, basically what it's telling me is that in order to decode one image of AlexNet, I would need at least 200 seconds on an Arduino, right? Because at 10 megaflops, if I want to do two giga flops, right, floating point operations per second, uh, operations, I will need 200 seconds. Now, uh, around 2009, Samsung came out with the Galaxy S. That was the first non-iPhone smartphone, so to say. Not the first, but the, probably the one that became the most popular around that time. What kind of computational capability did it have? A 1 gigahertz ARM processor, 512 megabytes of low power DDR1 RAM, clock speed 200 megahertz. That translates into about 1 billion floating point operations per, sec per second, right? which is interesting. Now we can actually already talk about doing AlexNet within possibly 2 seconds. In practice, of course, not that fast because you know I'd be limited by my DRAM speeds and so on. But at least it's not like the 200 seconds that you have in an Arduino. What about the data, the transfer capability, 200 megahertz of DDR, 400 mega transactions per second at 64 bits per lane, translates into about 3.2 gigabytes per second, about 30 gigabits per second. Okay, Getting better, much better. The Intel i7, this is, for example, what is there on uh, laptops from maybe two years ago, right? Uh, common configuration 3 gigahertz 4 cores ddr4 ram now these intel processors also have vector instructions things that are capable of doing a large number of floating point operations in parallel what that means is it can in principle do 32 single precision floating point operations per core per clock cycle and which translates into a pretty good peak of 400 gigaflops right now in practice I measured this on my laptop and you get to around 150 close to 200 or so right on something like the Intel kernel, the Linpack libraries that they provide. It also has a memory bandwidth of 40 gigabytes per second. Right? You compare this with Arduino's megabytes per second and we are talking about a factor of 1000. Okay? But then comes the GPUs, the graphics cards, right? NVIDIA Titan RTX. 4000 dot processors at 1.3 gigahertz graphic DDR memory 12 teraflops capacity right and in such cases the point is you cannot simply increase the compute capability without being able to feed it data so necessarily they also have to make sure that they do something to improve the memory bandwidth and in this case they manage to get it up to 100 gigabytes per second okay now just to sort of round things off, I also want to mention FPGAs, right? What happens with FPGAs, you can use DSP slices to build floating point units if you want. Typically, one, DS, uh, one floating point unit will need four DSP slices. A high-end FPGA has around 2,000 such slices, which means you can make around 500 floating point units. Now, that's interesting. When you compare this with the GPU, you actually realize that you can do less floating point units on the FPGA than on a GPU, okay? So that doesn't really seem to be the best place to compete. What about speed? You can get to 300 megahertz probably comfortably on an FPGA. You might be able to push 400, 500 on the newer ones. But even at 300, we are talking around 150 gigaflops. At 500, 250, right? Nowhere near the teraflops that we are talking about on a GPU. So here's the thing. Given all of this, why do people actually allow and even bother to work with FPGAs? Why not just do everything with DSPs, uh, GPUs today, right? And the main point over here is that there are other things you can do with FPGAs. If you're, if you're trying to do floating point, this is probably not the right way to go, 
right? On the other hand, if you can reduce the number of bits, if you can do some kind of hardware optimization, if you can do other things that allow you to use something customized, which a GPU cannot do, that's when FPGA is really good, right? Plus the fact that they can do bit level manipulation very efficiently, far better than anything a GPU, a GPU can do. Those are the places where FPGAs really success.